Some people, they just got fired and they had no idea why. Some people were detained, losing access to healthcare. How many have been detained as prisoners in their own country? How many have denied pensions? How many have lost their job? This is a day of national shame. Yeah. The Wintra scandal almost embodies, in a way, for some people, how black people are seen and treated in the UK because it's this example where people who did all the right things suddenly had a huge amount of their rights and their access to things that they'd always taken to granted just taken away from them without any real explanation. It really becomes this question of, was that just something that was a series of really, really unfortunate mistakes? Or is there something at play where it is because the vast majority of the Woodruff generation is black? The motherland. That's what Britain was called, the motherland. And then the mother just rejected her children. For what reason? We didn't do anything wrong. Surrey sees the arrival of more than 400 happy Jamaicans. They've come to seek work in Britain and are ready and willing to do any kind of job that will help the motherland along the road to prosperity. So the Empire Windrush was a ship that actually came to England in 1948 and most of its passengers were from the Caribbean and they were all coming to England to live and work across the UK and it's become synonymous with an entire generation of people that came over about 25 years because it was people who came from at the time what was colonies in the British Empire to the UK to live in England as citizens of that empire. In 1954, about 10, West the Windrush generation embodies a pivotal moment in British history. Their arrival would set a new course for the nation toward multiculturalism. But to better understand issues around race today, we have to look to Britain's past, specifically the British Empire. In the 1600s, England colonised much of what is now places like Jamaica and um, through over hundreds of years developed this trade network which involved taking millions of people from Africa and then taking them to the Caribbean and then forcing them to work on slave plantations where conditions were horrific. But it was a crucial part of the British Empire's economy. When British slavery ended in the 1830s, there was no real investment in the colonised countries. The formerly enslaved Africans who lived in these colonies essentially became British citizens and began to migrate around the empire to find work. Around the beginning of the 20th century, the United Kingdom began to restrict its immigration policies, severely impacting how many people outside Britain could earn. But when the motherland needed labour, it put out a call for workers. Britain needed people to rebuild after World War II, after being decimated. They're all full of hope for the future, so let's make them very welcome as they begin their new life over here. Hundreds of thousands of people would come from former British colonies to the UK. And that seems like a reasonable step to take because they were part of this global empire and because they had this connection to, to England. When the Empire Windrush arrived, I think a Calypso singer was asked to sing the song, which was like, London is the place for me. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. And it was about you the beauty of the city and about America, settling down there and just the excitement of being in London. Now the end of their journey is near. What will they find in the land they regard as an Eldorado? But then the experiences of some people obviously wasn't great some white people refused to work besides black people. Some people were refused jobs. Some people were sent to live in, in accommodation that was horrible. There is this big discrepancy between how people see themselves who are coming from places like Jamaica to how people saw them coming in. There was a real kind of hostility amongst some parts of the population to these new arrivals. And it was in some way specifically because they were, they were black. My name is Glenda Caesar. I'm a Windrush campaigner, stroke victim. I came to the UK when I was three months old. Both my parents are from Dominica. Mummy and Daddy came over in the 60s and they came over for a better life. You know, they wanted their own home in the motherland, uh, England. They were told that the streets were paved with gold. <laughs> They respected England. England was everything to them. And how did you find growing up in London? Oh, I loved it. Our house was right in the middle of the road, so it was so diverse because there was 
families from every country. We had Indian family, a family from Pakistan, a family from Bangladesh, Mauritians, St. Vincent, English, Scottish, Irish. It was so diverse. And if anyone had asked you when you were growing up where you were from, what would you have said? England, I'm British. I had never been to Dominica. I didn't know something was wrong until after my mum went to Dominica on holiday and my mum felt sick out there and I wanted to go out there and be with my mum. I made an application for um, a British passport and that's when I found out that they said, no, you're not British. If you leave this country again, you won't be able to come back. And I was just getting told you're not British. I had my youngest son in 1988 and that's when I found out that he wasn't British either. Within that time my mum passed away um, um, yeah, and I, <laughs> I just I couldn't get out there to be with my mum. We want to ensure that only legal migrants have access to the labour market, free health services, housing, bank accounts and driving licences. And this is not just about making the UK a more hostile place for illegal migrants, it is also about fairness. So in 2012, there's this issue of immigration coming up again, and there's this real sense that Britain doesn't have control over its borders. The British government enforced an immigration policy known as the hostile environment. The message was clear. If you're here illegally, pack your bags and leave. But the hostile environment swept up more than illegal immigrants. Citizens of the British Commonwealth were caught in the dragnet, and it turned their lives upside down. I retired and I took a part-time position in 2009 and it was then that it started getting complicated because the employer wanted more documentation from me to say that I was British and I was like well I've got a work history um, you can go anywhere I've got my children's birth certificate all British they're all British you can check but that wasn't good enough and um, I got terminated from my part-time position as a GP administrator because I didn't have the right to work here. And that's when I realised it was really, really serious. Really serious. Good boy. I got into debt, a lot of debt. I nearly lost my home. I was in court many times trying to save the roof over my head. So I started selling old trainers so that I wouldn't have to Asked my children to help me financially, you know, top up the gas, top up electric. I need some food. And even with my daughter, I had to share her benefits, her disability benefits. But it, it, it was embarrassing sometimes because sometimes you get to a position where you want to buy something, you feel, oh God, I've got to ask them and they've got their children to maintain as well. My son got depressed and I got depressed as well. And I started blaming myself. Uh, and there was a time where I contemplated um, suicide. But in my head, I'm thinking, but if I do that, then what's going to happen to the grandkids? And then how's he going to get out of the situation? Since 1971, it had been UK law that anyone who'd come from Commonwealth countries before 1973, like Glenda's parents from Dominica, could stay. But many weren't given documentation to prove when they had arrived. This hadn't been an issue until the hostile environment came into effect. To make matters worse, the government department in charge of immigration destroyed the landing cards of those that came between 1948 and 1973. Those landing cards could have been used potentially as a way of the Windrush generation proving their right to be in the country. So the fact is, is that we don't actually know how many people were caught up in it. It's, fa it's safe to say thousands, but it's sad, but some people have died without us knowing. But today, theirs would be Glenda the fought for the best part of a decade to prove she was a citizen. Task force. Even though in my head I was British, I thought maybe I haven't done enough. Is that a smile? It is a smile. What happened? I've been, they've told me because I came before 1971, I should get my British citizenship. They called my son's name and said, oh no, he's got his citizenship. And I burst out crying because um, the journey wasn't about me. It was about my son, him, him belonging. Sorry. 
Morning, Home Secretary. Morning. When will your government get a grip on the Windrush crisis? The UK government acknowledged its mistake and undertook a compensation programme for victims of what became known as the Windrush scandal. There was an opportunity to right the wrongs done by past governments and to offer payment after apologising to that generation for what they'd suffered. But the reality was significantly more complicated. For Glenda and so many others like her, the hostile environment wouldn't end when they got their citizenship. The UK government offered her £22,000 for loss of employment, being detained and impact on life. 22000 for, what, nearly nine to ten years of loss of everything. No way. I was so mad. I, I was fuming. That didn't even cover my wages. That wouldn't even have covered the unemployment benefit if I was entitled to it for those years. I always say it's like a, a burglar burgling your house and then you have to go and beg this burglar to give you back your stuff. On average, people were receiving less than £10,000 as part of as part of the payment um, when people have been out of work for years. So imagine how, many, how, how much money you have lost if you haven't been able to work for, say, five years. There are many that will criticise the government for how it arrived at the numbers. But in the tone and in the difficulty and in the lack of belief of those who have suffered in turning the burden on them to prove that they have been systemically abused and then not being satisfied with their paper trail or their answers. I think we really learned that neither the substantive redress nor its delivery um, has been acceptable. There continues to be major concerns amongst uh, the community of survivors and those that support them, that the scheme will ever be fit for purpose. And that's because some of the tweaking that has happened hasn't fundamentally altered the fact that it is a scheme that remains lacking in impartiality and really gives the sense of the government marking its own homework. Now, that is a government that many will accept is guilty of institutional racism and so really justice must not only be done but it must be seen to be done. We have set up a unit which is helping those people to get the documents that they need. They are British, they are part of us. I think you have to say that actually there's a lot more lessons to learn um, but ultimately we haven't yet as a society and as a country, said sorry in, in really a very meaningful way. Last year, after George Floyd's murder, we saw protests across the UK, which in a way mirrored the ones that we saw in the US. And a big part of that was about the Windrush scandal. The scandal will always be an example of a really just blatant form of discrimination and of wrongdoing against people who were almost all black. So it's, it's a question of, what do you do with that information? Do you incorporate it into a larger narrative around how black people are treated in this country? Or do you treat that as an isolated incident that is unfortunate, but isn't, doesn't really engage with race? For many, the Windrush scandal is symbolic of the UK's track record on race. During the pandemic, 64% of essential health workers who contracted COVID-19 were from black or ethnic minority backgrounds and there's a disproportionate number of black residents in the United Kingdom who've died from coronavirus. Inequality permeates British society. There's still this question of why do white families have nine times that of a black African family? Is it because the black family isn't trying hard enough? Is it because there's a single parent or is it because there's systematic failings at play? That, that as I say, I think that conversation is unresolved.